Um, thank you yeah. all for coming. Welcome to the first session of four sessions devoted to Bleak House. I'm John Jordan, and I'm in, I'm in Santa Cruz, uh, California, the home of the Dickens Project. I'm one of the two directors of the Dickens Project. And I want to make sure that everyone uh, knows Courtney Mahaney, who is the assistant director. Courtney is over to the left, uh, at the top, waving to, to people. And Courtney is the, doing the magic that makes all of this possible. And she will help me if I need any help. Um, one of the things that I want to do as part of today's session is to show the illustrations, some of the illustrations to, to Bleak House, which form an integral part of the text. And so um, when, you, when you read the novel or reread the novel, because I'm sure that many of you have read it before, um, perhaps many times, uh, please, uh, it's, it's highly desirable that you uh, familiarize yourself with the original illustrations. If you have an edition, if you're reading the novel in an edition that does not have the illustrations, they are readily available online. All you have to do is to uh, search for Bleak House illustrations and uh, you, will, you will find them. Um, uh, one of the things that Courtney will assist me in doing is recognizing people uh, in, in the order in which they raise their hands or indicate that they would like to speak. Uh, as, I, as I said a, a couple of minutes ago, we have uh, in, in principle, there are 68 people uh, who have registered for today's class. And um, that's, goodness, a very large group. Um, I, I hope that we can make it possible for anyone who wants to speak, wants to ask a question, wants to contribute to, to do so. But um, in order to do that, you'll probably need to uh, use the raised hand function in the chat or um, just signal with your, your physical hand and, and Courtney will, will try and keep track of uh, people who want to speak. I certainly don't intend to speak for, for two hours. Uh, I, I, I really want to uh, lead this as a, largely as a discussion. I'll say a few things by way of preliminary introduction and um, then uh, start at the beginning and uh, we'll, uh, there is one ground rule though, which is that uh, we've divided the reading assignment for the four sessions that we will have into uh, a, a specific number of chapters. And uh, as, as you know, as all of you know, uh, Dickens published his novels serially. And so for purposes of our discussion, we will limit ourselves today to the first 16 chapters of the novel. And so there's a rule. <laughs> and the rule is that we can't refer to anything uh, beyond uh, the end of chapter 16. Now that, that may be difficult to do because uh, uh, Bleak House is, is full of hints and clues about where the story is going to go. But if I hear anyone say something that I think uh, refers to events or circumstances beyond chapter 16. I'm going to um, uh, try and try and quell that intervention, and um, because there may be some people who are reading it for the first time, and and Bleak House is, uh, among other things, it is a detective novel. It's one of the very first detective novels in English literature. And um, so uh, in a detective novel, in any detective story, one of the things that is happening is that the reader is also a detective. So you are all detectives and you are reading to um, figure out what the mystery is uh, and where the story is going to go. So, 
that's the rule that will organize our discussion. Uh, nothing beyond chapter 16. So Bleak House is the ninth novel that Dickens wrote. So uh, it was published in serial form from uh, 1852, I think it begins in March of 1852 and concludes the following year in September of 1853. And uh, like the, the many of the novels that are published in this uh, particular format, it appears in 20 monthly parts, um, published as 19 because the last monthly part or the last monthly installment or monthly number is a double monthly number. So if you were a Victorian reader, you would be reading this over, over 19 months. And when we read as modern readers, it's always helpful if you know where the serial installments begin and end. So in the first monthly number, for example, there are four chapters, chapters one through four. And when you, when you read a, a Dickens novel that's published in this format, um, you should think of the, the various building blocks that, that Dickens uses in order to organize his presentation. And one of them, the most obvious, that's familiar to many novels, most novels, in fact, is the chapter. So uh, you should think about each chapter as its own unit. And one of the things that's always interesting is how to ask yourselves as you read, how does the chapter begin and how does the chapter end? Um, and the same holds true for the monthly number. Uh, so in the installment, the first installment, chapters one through four, you wanna ask yourselves, how does the chapter, how does the monthly number rather uh, begin and how does it end? But in Bleak House, we have a, a particular uh, curiosity. It's one of the distinctive features of, of, of this novel that it has two narrators. So in the first monthly number, chapters one and two are narrated by a, uh, an omniscient narrator, an impersonal narrative voice. And chapters three and four are narrated by Esther. They're narrated in the first person. Um, so that we alternate between third person narration and first person narration. But there's another um, alteration, alternation that takes place in the novel, which is that the first person narrator, the omniscient or the impersonal voice speaks always in the present tense. And Esther, the other narrator speaks always in the past tense or almost always in the past tense. Sometimes she speaks in the present tense and the alternations between past and present tense are another thing that you need to keep track of. So Bleak House is famously a, a very long novel. Um, if you have the Penguin edition, for example, it's uh, over 900 pages long. Um, and it's quite an investment of readerly time to, to read something that is that long. And Bleak House is a particularly complex novel, um, complex in its plotting, complex in the number of characters that it introduces, both major characters and minor characters. Dickens is famous for his minor characters. And this novel is incredibly full of them. It's, it's uh, in, in, whenever I taught the novel to undergraduates, one of the problems that they always had was keeping track of who is who uh, in the novel. Um, and another thing that uh, I, I would call your attention to is that uh, it, for, Almost every chapter of the first half of the novel, a new character is introduced. So keeping track of, of who the characters are is, is both a challenge 
and it's one of the pleasures uh, of the novel. Um, uh, you, if if you're, you're interested in this sort of game, you, you might even keep track of who the new character is who gets introduced, uh, certainly in chapters one through 16, which is the focus for today, there's a new character who's introduced in every single chapter. Um, so keeping track of who the characters are, keeping track of uh, um, uh, what the new, who the new character is, who's introduced in a, in a chapter uh, is one of the things that you might pay attention to. And then you need to keep track also of the way that one monthly number uh, proceeds or is linked to the next monthly number. So in monthly number one, the first two chapters are narrated by the third person impersonal narrator speaking in the present tense, the next two chapters by Esther in the past tense. And then when, when we move into chapter into monthly number two, the first two chapters are narrated by Esther. And then the third chapter in that uh, monthly number is narrated by the other narrator. So there is a linkage that goes between one monthly number and, and the next. Um, a linkage and then an interruption or an alternation between one narrator and, and the other. And one of the things that you might keep your attention on is whether there is any monthly number that does not have both narrators. Um, usually you will have both narrators in any monthly number. Now, another thing uh, that Bleak House is famous for, um, and some readers, some students find this frustrating, is that it is a very slow novel. And I think the speed of the novel is deliberate, the pacing of the novel. And um, it moves slowly. It unfolds slowly. Um, and one reason for that is that a central plot element in the novel is the law case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce. And Jarndyce and Jarndyce is a lawsuit that has dragged on for centuries. <laughs> and it has no end in sight. And uh, it moves very slowly. So the novel imitates the speed of Jarndyce and Jarndyce in some respects. Um, it begins with a chapter in which nothing really happens or almost nothing happens. If you say, what's the plot of chapter one? Well, it's Jarndyce and Jarndyce and Jarndyce and Jarndyce doesn't move. It doesn't go anywhere. There are two wards in Jarndyce who are introduced at the very end of the, ch of the chapter. So there's a, a tiny bit of plot development, um, but not much really happens. It's, it's mostly a chapter that's devoted to description, description of the law court of chancery. Um, and um, uh, the second chapter uh, has a little bit of action. It moves to a different location. It moves to uh, the, the country. Another alternation that you might keep uh, your eye on is the way in which locations change. Uh, there are two principal locations, we could say in a, in a very general sense, the country and the city. And Bleak House is famously a novel about London the first word of the novel, the first sentence we could, we could say is London, period. It's, it's a sentence that has no verb. It's a sentence that has no action. Um, so the novel just at the level of grammar is very slow in getting started. Um, and the uh, third chapter, uh, the first chapter that Esther narrates is called A Progress. 
And if you're if you've been feeling it, this novel is very slow in getting started, you might look at the title of that third chapter and say, ah, at last, something is going to happen. And uh, it's true that Esther's narrative does move more rapidly than, uh, than the narrative of Jarnus and Jarnus. So uh, think about the pacing of, of the novel. Think about the deliberate slowness of the novel and then the points at which it picks up speed. And by the time we get to the end of the novel, I promised I wouldn't talk about anything beyond uh, chapter 16, but I can promise you that the pacing of the novel will pick up speed and there will be some chapters that uh, take place at a breathless pace uh, and are as exciting as any chapters that Dickens ever wrote. So, uh, speed of narration is, is also one of the things I hope that you will um, pay attention to as, as you read. So um, I, I, I want to uh, quote a passage that I'd like you to think about both for today uh, and as we uh, move forward with other um, sections of the novel. And it's one of the most famous passages in the novel. It's one that all the critics and all the commentators on the novel eventually come around to. And it's a, uh, a passage in, uh, in chapter 16, as it happens. It's um, um, toward the beginning of chapter 16. You, you don't need to, to find this passage right now, but it's the, um, the third person narrator who is speaking. And he asks a question, which I think is a, is a fundamental question about this novel. He says, what connection can there be between the place in Lincolnshire, the house in town, the mercury in powder, and the whereabout of Joe the outlaw with the broom who had that distant ray of light upon him when he swept the churchyard step. What connection can there have been between many people in the innumerable histories of this world who from opposite sides of great gulfs have nevertheless been very curiously brought together? Now that question about what connection can there be I think is a, it's a fundamental question about this novel because it's a novel that is so uh, vast in its scope. Um, the, this, this, uh, this passage asks about the, uh, the connection between the place in Lincolnshire, that's the house of the Dedlock family, Sir Lester Dedlock in the country and the house in town. So that's just one example. What's the connection between country and city? And what's the connection between the Mercury in powder, who's the uh, elegant servant wearing livery at the house in, uh, in, in town, the Deadlocks servant, the Deadlocks are uh, aristocrats at the very top of society, and Joe the outlaw with the broom. Joe is a, a homeless boy, a boy who, sweeps the, the street crossings for, for a living. So what's the connection between high and low? And this is a novel that um, as it begins and as it introduces its proliferation of characters from different backgrounds, uh, uh, the, the connections, what connection is there between these different places and, and people? That's, that's something that I think is a puzzle to us. And of course, we, if we're familiar at all with reading Dickens, we know that there are connections, that the connections may not be evident at the beginning, um, but they will become apparent as we progress further into the story. So we have at the beginning um, uh, two, two chapters that start one story, and then two chapters that start another story. There's the lawsuit that doesn't seem to move very fast. 
There's a story that has to do with the Deadlock family uh, living in Chesney Wold and something to do with lawyers. Uh, so there's, there's law that connects those. And then we start, the novel starts a third time when Esther begins to narrate. So it's a, it's a novel that starts in a, in a kind of disjointed way. Um, we get one plot or maybe two plots that are that the uh, third person narrator is telling us about. And then we get Esther who starts to tell what seems like a, a very different story. Um, so how are those plots connected? And then there's one final thing to, to comment on about um, the way that this novel begins. And it's that in organizing his novel the way that he does with two narrators, Dickens is doing something very unusual, very, very radical. It's, it's experimental even. Um, as a fictional technique. He's having more than one narrator and not just having more than one narrator. One of them is female and the other, well, it's hard to say um, what the gender is of that um, third person narrator. I, I tend to think that it's a he um, because the kinds of knowledge that that narrator has are uh, forms of knowledge that would not be common to most women in the Victorian period. But the fact remains that that's a, an ungendered uh, narration. But for Dickens to adopt uh, the persona, the narrative persona of a woman is a radical departure. Uh, this is a novel, uh, we, could, we could say at the level of narration, of female impersonation. And uh, Dickens had never done that before. He had, he had certainly had female characters, but he never had a female narrator, a woman, a woman narrator. And um, one of the things that uh, people always talk about and that we will need to talk about is how, how successful Dickens is at, in, at doing female impersonation. Um, and why, why did he choose to make a young woman um, the, the focus of that second narrative trajectory in, in the novel? How well does he do it? And how does that affect um, the way that we experience the novel? Um, and, uh, the, there's a contrast, a powerful contrast between the, uh, the voice of that omniscient narrator, the one that we encounter in the very first chapter, and the voice of Esther Summerson, Esther, the, the narrator of uh, uh, chapters, chapters three and four. And I wanna um, uh, conclude this sort of little introductory remark by a uh, set of remarks by, by, by reading the first paragraph of chapter one, uh, a famous, famous chapter and a famous paragraph. And the first uh, paragraph of uh, chapter three, which is Esther's first um, uh, first entrance into the novel. So chapter one, in Chancery. London, Michaelmas term lately over and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall. Implacable November weather, as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth. And it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus 40 feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill. Smoke lowering down from chimney pots, making a soft black drizzle with flakes of soot in it as big as full grown snowflakes gone into mourning, one might imagine, for the death of the sun. Dogs 
undistinguishable in mire. Horses, scarcely better, splashed to their very blinkers. Foot passengers jostling one another's umbrellas in a general infection of ill temper and losing their foothold at street corners where tens of thousands of other foot passengers have been slipping and sliding since the day broke, if the day ever broke, adding new deposits to the crust upon crust of mud, sticking at those points tenaciously to the pavement and accumulating at compound interest. I'll come back to that in just a minute. But I want to read now, by way of contrast, the first paragraph of chapter three. Uh, and this is our introduction to, to Esther Summerson. And you'll have to excuse me, I'm going to read this in a, in a voice that is my interpretation of, of Esther's voice. I have a great deal of difficulty in beginning to write my portion of these pages, for I know I am not clever. I always knew that. I can remember when I was a very little girl. Indeed, I used to say to my doll when we were alone together, now, Dolly, I am not clever. You know very well, and you must be patient with me like a dear. And so she used to sit propped up in a great armchair with her beautiful complexion and rosy lips, staring at me, or not so much at me, I think, as at nothing, while I busily stitched away and told her every one of my secrets. So one thing I would point out, and then I'm gonna ask you to comment on these two, these two paragraphs, is that the first narrative voice, that third person narrator, um, is I think a very powerful, eloquent uh, narrative voice. Um, it's, uh, it's a voice that uses figurative language. Uh, it, uh, it's a voice that uses imaginative uh, figures that famous uh, megalosaurus, 40 feet long waddling like an elephantine lizard, a poleborn hill. Um, uh, the snowflakes that look as if they've gone into mourning for the death of the sun. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a kind of cosmically oriented uh, uh, narrative voice. And Esther's voice, by contrast, is a very small, personal, insecure voice. Um, that, that first voice in chapter one is very self-confident, is very professional. Um, it, it, it starts the, the, the novel um, knowing what it wants to do. And Esther starts in a very uncertain way, apologizing almost for the fact that she's telling her story. I have a great deal of difficulty in beginning to write my portion of these pages, for I know I am not clever. Um, what's the relationship that Esther is establishing with her reader, and how does it make us feel um, um, to be addressed in this way? So the contrast between these two voices is, I think, one of the puzzles, what connection is there? What connection can there be between these two voices, these two modes of storytelling? One so professional, so we could almost say so Dickensian. Uh, I think uh, we, we, uh, if we've read other novels by Dickens, we can see the Dickensian imagination at work here. And then this other voice that is not at all self-confident, that is apologetic even for, for telling its story. Um, and uh, so uh, let me stop here and uh, ask you to comment about the way in which this novel begins and about 
the question of connections. What kinds of connections are we uh, making as we uh, enter into this fictional universe? And what do you think of those two uh, narrative voices? So Courtney will help me to call on people if uh, uh, you would be good enough to uh, uh, offer your opinions. And uh, um, I see a hand up from Glenna, so I will let Glenna have, have the first word. Unmute yourselves if, uh, if you speak. First of all, I have to say, John, go Giants. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, uh, I, share, one, I share that sentiment. I, share. I knew you would. Um, I just wanted to comment um, each time, I think this is the fourth or possibly the fifth time I've reread Bleak House. And the first time I read it, I was a teenager and I was of, under the influence of what was then the current critical consensus, I think, that Dickens just kind of threw words on a page and, you know, he, he had a great, uh, you know, gift, he was, you know, fecundity, etc. But the art was played down. And each time I have reread it, I've got a new appreciation for the art. And this time, it just, it dazzles me that Esther's, I mean, and under the influence of the old thinking, I found Esther merely annoying <laughs> because she was so insipid. And now the brilliance of that narrative voice that she introduces herself in this self-abnegating way. And yet you, you know, when you're attuned to this, the more you read, the more you understand that there's more to Esther than just the self-abnegation. And the omniscient voice, it's like, this is, this is, I mean, modernism, which was doing all kinds of things with narrative voices and, you know, stream of consciousness and so on. I mean, this is like, to me, the father of that kind of <laughs> narration. So anyhow, I've been dying to say that and now I've said it and I'll shut up. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Um, and you, you do put your finger on, I think, two very important things. I mean. Um, one is the, the brilliant, the, the, the gusto, the verve, the fertility, the wonderful imaginative force that lies in that first uh, paragraph from the omniscient narrator. And then this curious other voice that seems to be hiding itself, um, uh, apologetic, coy, uh, um, uh, lacking in, in confidence about its role as a, as a narrator, and yet revealing things that uh, make us look behind it, that make us look for something that may be absent. Why is this narrative voice speaking this way? And um, the first chapter poses questions about the city, about the environment, about the beginning, of the world, uh, as if the waters had newly retired from the face of the earth, and the end of the cosmos, the death, the death of the sun. We're, we're, you know, what's the time span of that? That first paragraph. It's the beginning of creation and the end of of uh, of, of existence, and then um, Esther, uh, and it's uh, Esther's narration. Uh, I, I'm convinced, and one of the things that I argue about this novel is that it is a profound psychological study. Um, and that uh, Esther, Esther's unconscious, es the depths of Esther's unconscious are something that we need to find out more about. So, so thank you for, for that, Glennon. Good start. Other comments, other things that people would like to say about uh, this? Alexis? Yes, I've always been puzzled when Esther begins, she, she talks about beginning to write her portion of these pages. Now, who has asked her to write her story? Who's writing the other portion of the pages? You know, uh, who, who is her audience? And, and she's writing 
I think from um, a historical perspective, looking back at the beginning of her life and her childhood, so someone must have said, tell me your story, but I'm not sure who her audience is. Very good questions. And that um, the fact that she says my portion of these pages indicates that she has some awareness that there is another portion, not hers. That mm -hmm. There's some other story that is being told um, or some other version perhaps of, of her story that exists. Um, who is her audience? It's very difficult to say at this point. Um, can we ever, will we ever know who her mm -hmm. audience is perhaps? at some later point, certainly not in the first 16 chapters, where we know mm -hmm. to whom she is speaking. Um, um, but it's a very good question to ask. And um, uh, uh, so uh, what, what is Esther's motive in telling her story? Mm -hmm. Why is she telling the story? What is, is she telling the story for herself? Because there is some value to her, some cathartic, some, uh, some emotional payoff for her in telling the story of her life? Um, uh, uh, what, what is, what's the value of the process for her? What, what motivates her? Those are very crucial questions to ask. So very good that you point them out. Phyllis? Hi. Yeah, Alexis, thank you. That was one of the questions that was bothering me um, a little bit. And, and thinking about what John has said earlier about the back and forth narrators, and then this idea of um, where Esther's coming from, I almost started to think of it as a duet between um, Dickens and her. And, um, and stop me, but I, uh, first of all, she comes right after Lady Dedlock has had a reaction to reading an affidavit and seeing the handwriting that it was composed in. And I'll say no more. Um, and there is, um, there is a sense, I, I thought as I read through this for the second time after many, many years, that the two duets were getting increasingly intertwined, um, both in Esther going back and saying, oh, well, I just told you this, but let's go back to what I was doing before. And I felt like they were getting closer and closer to one another in terms of um, perhaps Esther giving more color and, and insight into the omniscient narrator's kind of pronouncements. Um, then the second piece that I think is really interesting in this is the whole um, role that literacy plays in this novel and the lack of it and, and the actual act of writing, of putting letters on the page or chalking the walls or whatever, and that's sort of a side thing, but it's still that feeling of that writing means something, right? And the writing in jarndice means nothing, right? It just destroys people, but other writing could mean something. And so, but I really, I love that idea, John, of the, the two narrators going back and forth. That's very helpful, thank you. Yes, yes, and um, you're, you're doing exactly the kind of reading that needs to be done, which is to look for connections. I mean, what connection can there be between this and that? So um, to think of these, uh, uh, these two narrative trajectories as being a duet, do they speak to each other? Do they speak past each other? How are they connected? And how can we as readers bring them together? And you mentioned one thing that's a very crucial motif already in the book, which is writing. Um, both uh, the written word uh, and the, the form of the written word, bec because it's, uh, it, it comes out in the, um, when Crook, who is illiterate, uh, chalks the letters of Jarndus on the wall, and because he's illiterate, he, he can't read or write, but he has studied the form of those letters and can reproduce them without making sense of them. So we too are in the position of reading things 
and looking not only at what they say, that is the meaning of, we think of, of written words as having meaning and it's the meaning that's important, but it's the form of the writing. And so when Lady Dedlock has that reaction, she says, who wrote that? And there's something about the handwriting that, that prompts her to do that. And then you may remember, I'm trying to, I'm starting to make connections, but I'm playing off of your, your very useful comment that Esther also receives a letter um, in uh, chapter three. And it's a letter that comes from Kengi and Carboy. It's a legal document. And um, if, if, you, if you have that passage, I'll, 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 I'll read it or I'll, I'll try to read it because it's a very difficult document to read. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, Madam, Jarndyce and Jarndyce are, and, and you run into the problem there. How do you pronounce that next set of letters? Um, and it's legal shorthand. Uh, it's the way that uh, in the 19th century, a law writer, this is before the the <laughs> before Xerox machines and photocopying and uh, all legal documents were hand copied. And so there is a law writer. Every law firm had a law writer who copied the legal documents. And so this is a legal document. This is a letter that is addressed to Esther and Adam. And our CLT, our oh, uh, uh, our is short for client. Our client, Mr. Jarndyce, being a, a B T about to re receive into his house under an order of the court of, <laughs> and you know you can go on and, and sort of uh, play with this. But what's happening is that there is a kind of deformation of language that is the result of the way in which it is represented on the page. And this is not the only instance of that. There's something about the way in which language is transcribed on paper that is signifying things. So Lady Dedlock has read something, has looked at a legal document. Esther has now looked at a legal document. And both of them, um, now, uh, let me just, when Esther reads that letter that she receives from Kengi and Carboy that uh, tells her basically that, that a guardian is now going to um, take charge of her. Uh, she's an orphan. Uh, she, she has no family so far as she knows. The only person she has known in her life, her godmother, who turns out to have been her aunt, has died. And she receives this letter that says that a guardian will, um, we have arranged for you to be uh, uh, forwarded, carriage free, et cetera. An eligible companion will be provided, et cetera. And so here is Esther's reaction. Remember, Lady Dedlock has a reaction to seeing some handwriting. Mm -hmm. Esther says, oh, never, never shall I forget the emotion this letter caused in the house. It was so tender in them to care so much for me. It was so gracious in that father who had not forgotten me to have made my orphan way so smooth and easy and to have inclined so many youthful natures toward me that I could hardly bear it. Now, for me, there's, there's some interesting things about that reaction. One is the first sentence, I never, 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 um, oh, excuse me, oh, never, never, never shall I forget the emotion this letter caused in the house. What is Esther not telling us? She's not telling us what the emotion caused in her. And she displaces the emotion that she must have felt 
that she can't say anything about onto the other people. It was so good of them to have, it was so tender in them to care so much for me. It was so gracious in that father who had not forgotten me, father capitalized, uh, a reference to the deity here, but also perhaps with some sense that perhaps she's thinking about who her father might be. Who is this guardian? Who is the, what is, what's behind the law, the letter that, that she has received. So I think Esther is curious about her family, her origins, but she can't quite bring herself to talk about it openly. So she has an emotion that she can't name. Um, and uh, I always think of Esther as hiding something from us. Um, why is she hiding? What is she hiding? What does she know? Uh, why doesn't she know some things? Um, anyway, so anyway, thank you for introducing those themes and drawing some useful connections. Other people, other comments? Uh, um, Blair? Blair. Uh, yeah. First of all, John, just a question about chapter eight, which is what I'm gonna be commenting on. The, the um, narrator there is Esther, right? We'll take a look at your copy. Chapter eight, governing a uh, multitude. Covering a multitude of sins. Multitude of sins. Yes. Yes, that's what I thought. I, now, one of the things that impresses me about Esther, she may not be clever, but she does have rather keen abilities when it comes to observation. And uh, going forward a little bit in that chapter, uh, when she is in conversation with Mrs. Partigle, and Mrs. Partigle introduces her five boys, we then have what is one of my favorite selections from Dickens, but nobody else I know who's a Dickens fan agrees with me. They pretty much pass right over these. Dickens was concerned with how you, with generosity. And here we have an example of what generosity isn't. When it goes bad, when people are forced to be generous, they become like Scrooge, who, uh, uh, when he's being when Scrooge is being solicited by the two fundraisers, he says that he has already been generous with, through his taxes and so forth. And uh, anyway, here, the five boys are presented beautifully here. Uh, <laughs> let me just read a little bit, if you don't mind. These young ladies, says, said Mrs. Particle, I, I have the Oxford edition, I read it to page 101, said Mrs. Particle, with great volubility, after the first salutations, are my five boys. You may have seen their names in a printed subscription list, perhaps more than one in the possession of our esteemed friend, Mr. Jarndyce. Egbert, my eldest, 12, is the boy who sent out his pocket money to the amount of five and threepence to the Takahuku Indians. Oswald, my second, 10 and a half, is the child who contributed two and nine pence to the great national Smithers testimonial. Francis, my third, nine, one and six pence, half penny, Felix, my fourth, seven, eightpence to the superannuated widows. Alfred, my youngest, five, has voluntarily enrolled himself in the infant bonds of joy and is privileged never through life to use tobacco in any form. Then comes the real ringer. I love the next line. We had never seen such dissatisfied children. It was not merely that they were reasoned and shriveled, though they cer were certainly that too, but they looked absolutely ferocious with discontent. At the mention of the Takahuku Indians, I could really have supposed Egbert to be one of the most baleful members of the tribe. He gave me such a savage frown. Dickens, who certainly must have been, by this point in his career, solicited by a lot of people for a lot of money, uh, 
communicates to us that if it's not coming from the heart, if people are forced to be generous, you're going to get a bunch of angry people on your hands. It's just not going to work. And I think that that is a profound, as, as one who used to be a university moral philosophy professor, this is, this is profound to find in a uh, book of literature, especially from my favorite author. Anyhow, that's, John, that's as much as I want to say here uh, about, about generosity and Dickens. Uh, it's a great passage. So thank you for singling it out. Um, it jumps us ahead uh, somewhat in, in the story. Um, and uh, it, yes, it is narrated by Esther. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna get to your point in just a second, but I'll point out something that I, that I find very interesting about this chapter. Um, and I, I, I mentioned one of the things I'm interested in is how sections begin and how they end. And um, chapter eight begins, it was interesting when I dressed before daylight to peep out of window where my candles were reflected in the black panes like two beacons and finding all beyond still enshrouded in the indistinctness of last night. So Esther is just waking up. She's just uh, waking up in the morning. If you go back to the end of chapter six, there's an intervening chapter. Um, you don't have to look at it. Esther goes to sleep. And in the interval is chapter seven, the ghost walk, which is narrated by the other uh, narrator. Um, so Esther goes to sleep the end of chapter six. The ghost walk narrated by the other narrator takes place in chapter seven. And then in chapter eight, Esther wakes up. So Esther has been asleep during the narration of chapter seven, the ghost walk. I, I propose that the ghost walk happens while Esther is asleep and that it is a kind of dream that takes place in the world of Esther's unconscious, that that's another connection. But chapter eight, to go forward and to return to the point where you took us, is very much about uh, Victorian philanthropy. It's a commentary on philanthropy, generosity, the lack thereof or the hypocrisy thereof. It, uh, Mrs. Pardiggle uh, is another version of Mrs. Jellybee uh, from earlier in the novel. Um, the chapter in which Mrs. Jellybee appears is called Telescopic Philanthropy. Uh, Mrs. Pardiggle and Mrs. Jellybee are both um, women who are engaged in philanthropic endeavors. And their philanthropic endeavors are uh, directed at uh, distant locations rather than to their own families. So one of the um, critiques that is being made is that telescopic philanthropy leads to um, household failures in household management and in particular to failures in mothering. I think it's important that um, some people have, have said, and I think there's a point to this, that Dickens is, is perhaps too harsh on, um, on women philanthropists in general, who were among the, uh, uh, the leaders of women's rights activities in the 19th century, and that Dickens is satirizing, um, perhaps without a full understanding of the importance of women's issues in the 19th century. But putting that aside, these two instances are clearly instances of philanthropy gone wrong. And the treatment of uh, Mrs. Pardiggle's children by their mother is evidence that there is a, a household rebellion that's about to take place. And, um, the other dimension of it, though, is that there's a, there's a difference 
between Mrs. Jellyby and Mrs. Pardiggle that, I, that is very important. And Mrs. Pardiggle is an example of a visiting lady. Mrs. Pardiggle doesn't just send money overseas to uh, Africa, to Boreo Bulaga. Mrs. Pardiggle takes religious tracts and takes them to the homes of working class families and uh, tries to engage them in um, proper moral behavior. Uh, if, they, if they could only be more religious, uh, an evangelical spokesman might say, then this would save them uh, from the misery in which they live. Um, and this is a, uh, Dickens is having fun at, at this and the rebellious children uh, in the passages that you read are, are wonderfully uh, comic in, in that respect. But another dimension of this is the working class people who are the object of her philanthropy. And um, one of the things I think that is most striking about this is the way in which the working class respond to the efforts of Mrs. Pardigal. So you read the passage that satirizes uh, the, the mother and her children. Um, let me read the way that the, the working class family responds to this. Um, so I'm uh, picking up a paragraph. You can't tire me, good people, said Mrs. Pardiggle to these latter. I enjoy hard work and the harder you make mine, the better I like it. Then make it easy for her, growl the man upon the floor. I want it done and over. I want an end of these liberties took with my place. I want an end of being drawed like a badger. Now you're a going to Paul Pry and question according to custom. I know what you're going to be up to. Well, you haven't got no occasion to be up to it. I'll save you the trouble. Is my daughter a washing? Yes, she is a washing. Look at the water, smell it. That's what we drinks. How do you like it? And what do you think of a gin instead? Ain't my place dirty? Yes, it's dirty. It's naturally dirty and it's naturally unwholesome. And we've had five dirty and unwholesome children as is all dead infants and so much the better for them and for us besides. Have I read the little book what you left? No, I ain't read the little book what you left. There ain't nobody here as knows how to read it. And if there was, it wouldn't be suitable to me. It's a book fit for a babby and I'm not a babby. If you was to leave me a doll, I wouldn't muss it. I shouldn't, I shouldn't muss it. How have I been in, in conducting of myself? Why, I've been drunk for three days and I'd have been drunk four if I'd had the money. Don't I never mean to go for to church? No, I don't never mean to go to church for to go to church. I shouldn't be expected there. If I did, the beetles too genteel for me. And how did my wife get that black eye? Why, I give it to her. And if she says I didn't, she's a lie. This, this is an extraordinary passage um, because it's the working class speaking in their own voice back against the philanthropists. So it's not just the children who are unhappy. These are the supposed beneficiaries of the uh, good works, the generosity of Mrs. Pardigal. And this is an angry lower class voice, as you can tell from the grammar, I do a terrible job of imitating the voice, but uh, it really needs a, uh, someone who can do the, the, the accent properly to, to give it its, uh, but you get the vehemence uh, that lies behind it. The resentment, the class anger. Um, this is a novel that among other things is about class conflict. And uh, um, uh, here uh, the, the negligent mother, uh, and her children is one form of suffering, but the conditions under which the working class live and the reactions that they have to well-intended, but uh, socially blind generosity is, uh, is an important theme in this, in this chapter. So thanks for calling attention to it. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Vicki? Vicky. 
Oh, you'll need to unmute yourself. We need to unmute, Vicki. Thank you, sorry. I, I love the opening of the book. I love the fog. The <laughs> fog to me is very English and it brings it back totally. But what I love is that the fog really describes the fog everybody's in because there is no easy organization. There is organization in bits, but what I'm trying to say is that we as a reader are left wanting to know things. We don't like being not given the details of what we're supposed to read or think. And the fog hangs just like the fog does in London and it hangs over the story. And to me, it made the story much stronger and much more lifelike and realistic because I've endured these fogs and I know of them. And, and I'm sorry, but you know, it, it, it really made me addicted to the book from the very beginning. And as the fog unfolds, you've got a little bit of information each time, but it's not quite going away yet. And I just love it for that. Yes. Um... The fog is, 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 is famous, and the fog is one of the things that is a point of connection because the fog appears both in the uh, Court of Chancery and it appears in the house in Lincolnshire, uh, which is surrounded by fog. And when Esther first arrives in London, she's met by a clerk. Um, Clark, whom we later learned to identify as Mr. Guppy, uh, who's one of the uh, wonderful comic characters in the novel. And she says, uh, is something on fire? And he says, oh, it's just a London particular. Uh, so Esther comes- it's Recording in progress. Yes. yes. The, the, the fog is everywhere and the fog is also uh, one of the, the metaphors of, of the novel. It's one of the things that embraces uh, all locations and includes us as, as readers of the narr narrative, who, as you say, are, are uh, we, we're doled out little bits of information. We're not given uh, a, an overall perspective that allows us to understand everything. So we too are, in a way, uh, in, involved in, in, in the fog. Um, so yes, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. David? Okay, I have some unconnected comments. Uh, in rereading the book, I am impressed at how carefully constructed it is in that first chapter, uh, just in passing, Dickens sets up two of the minor characters who are going to be important. He's established the, the tone and his subject, and then he spreads out, and then he gets to Esther. Uh, one thing about the construction, I've been looking at the end of each serial number and he's very careful what he leaves you with. When I was in, in college, everybody who read the book dumped on Esther and <laughs> said, isn't she awful? And I've decided over time we always knew that Dickens was fascinated children, abused children. And it's come to me that a lot of his adults are the product of an abused childhood. 
that this also is something that interests him. He wants to know what being mistreated does. That Esther is very much the product of an abusive early childhood. And one of the things is this feeling of inferiority on her part, and another is she feels she has to earn people's love. I'll stop there. <laughs> Everything you say is 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 pertinent. Um, I think the apologetic tone that Esther adopts and that she uh, maintains through much of the of the novel uh, is indeed the result of her early upbringing. But I think it has even deeper roots than than that that we will come to understand better as we um, as we read farther. Um, you mentioned uh, two minor characters who are introduced in the very first chapter. And they're mentioned only in passing and at the very end. And they are, um, you, you didn't name them, but they are the little mad woman, whom we later learn is Miss Flight. And the other is the man from Shropshire, who turns out to be Mr. Gridley, we learn later. Um, so uh, these things that are mentioned only in passing, happened to come up later. So I think Dickens knew from the very beginning how everything was connected. He knew that even the minor characters, uh, people who are mentioned not by name uh, in, in either instance here, are going to acquire names and are going to acquire a function in the plot. And I, I wanted to take this opportunity to look at one of the illustrations. Um, and so, Courtney, I'm going to ask you to help me make sure that I do this correctly. Um, so I, I need to. Oh, Courtney. Um, so uh, go to the share screen at the yes. bottom. Share screen. Yes. And then choose PowerPoint from the windows that you see. Gonna need you to put it up. Oh, I see it, I see it, okay. Um, yes, okay. I'm going to look at the very first illustration. We, we've been talking about beginnings and, and endings of sections. And this is the illustration. Can, can we get? Uh, no, um, let's see, would you like me to put it on display? Yes, if you would, Courtney. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see? Uh, so yes. Is, did you say the first illustration? Yes, the, the, the little old lady. So, um, uh, yeah. Okay. Does everyone see it? I, I say so Bleak House chapters one through 16. Yes, it's visible, the little old lady. The little old lady, okay. Um, so tell me what you see. Who are the people? What do you see? Where is this set uh, taking place? And um, just tell me your reaction to this first illustration. Any, anyone, just, just blurt it out. Okay. The, the, the thing that you don't see is Esther's face. That's the key thing. That's, yeah. that's, that certainly is one of the key things. Yeah. And that follows through th uh, throughout all the uh, illustrations with Esther in it uh, in the first 16 chapters that we really don't see her face. Um, seldom do we see it. We, uh, yeah. Yes. So, um, is there any, who who else is in the image? Well, there's Miss Flight, who is one of my favorite minor characters in all of Dickens. Yes. Okay. Richard and Ada. 
Richard and Ada on the right. And the, side the, and the foggy scene behind with the, the coach. Yes, the, that's one reason I wanted to show this is that it has the fog in it. Yes. Um, so I want you to focus in particular on the figure of Esther. And the, the obvious thing, the most important thing to comment on is that we do not see her face. So we need to, we need to say more about why we do not see her face. But before we talk about the missing face or the hidden face, is there anything else about the figure of Esther that strikes you as unusual? You can see her wedding in the hand. She you can see her. you can see something about her hand. Yes, she if she had been married, you would have seen it because you'd have seen the ring. Yes. Okay. Um what one thing I should uh comment on is that uh Ada is seen in full face. Esther's face is missing. Ada, her companion, is seen in full face and we can see Ada's perfectly oval face. Ada is a type of Victorian young female beauty. Um, so what about Esther's body? She's also mediating, she's also mediating between um, the wards whom she sort of feels mother protectress for and this sudden apparition who might be threatening, who might be dangerous. You can see the, uh, the, two, the two actions in Esther's body. One, she's walking away with the lower half of her body and the upper half of her body is looking back uh, out of some sort of politeness, but all three figures are recoiling from Miss Flight, who is so solicitous and charming and friendly uh, in this picture. Also, it seems to me that Esther is kind of bent over in a very kind of subservient position, like I'm not as good as. I think her hand shows that she's warning Ada and Richard a little about Miss Flight. She's uncertain of her, she doesn't know. Uh, whether she's a, a force for good or evil, and her hand seems to be warning them. Okay, I'll I'll tell you what strikes me about this this uh, image of this, Esther's body. I can't tell where her feet are located. I can't tell where her hips are located. I can't tell which shoulder of hers is closer to the picture plane? Is she facing toward Miss Flight or is she facing toward Ada? Uh, the sash that she is wearing is on a diagonal. I, I would propose that she is, that her hips are toward Ada and in the direction of the steps of the court but that her shoulders are turning toward Miss Flight and that the diagonal of her sash indicates that she is twisting the upper part of her body toward Miss Flight in order to look at Miss Flight. Um, where is her hand coming from? In one reading of her body, you could say that hand is coming out of her right buttock. If she is facing toward Miss Flight, that hand has a very awkward relationship to where her body is. If she's facing toward Ada, the hand makes sense. It makes better sense. But the hand is awkwardly attached to the rest of her body depending on how you read where Esther is facing. The little old lady, the title of this, refers initially, of course, to Miss Flight. But remember that, that Esther has a series of nicknames, little old woman, Dame Durden, um, Cobweb, Mother Hubbard. Um, uh, I think that 
Esther is poised between two versions of female appearance. One is Ada, beauty. The other is the little old lady. Which one is a mirror image of Esther? I think Esther is caught between the two. Esther is beautiful. How do we know that Esther is beautiful? Guppy sees her and falls in love with her at first sight. Does Esther know that she is beautiful? No, she's happy to pretend that she is a little old lady like Miss Flight. So for me, this is an image that is, reflects another motif in the novel, which is mirrors. Esther frequently looks in mirrors and what she sees or doesn't see in mirrors is always of interest. So for me, this is a mirror scene in which Esther has a mirror to her right in the form of Ada and a mirror to the left, which is Miss Flight. And those are two versions of her identity. Uh, and the figure uh, that what I see as an ambiguity in the positioning of her body is um, a little bit like those, those images of the, the rabbit duck, you know, the gestalt images, which if you read it one way, uh, it's a rabbit. If you read it another way, it's a duck. Esther's, the, the, the figure of, of Esther's body and the absence of a face make it ambiguous as to which direction she is facing. So think about mirrors and I will go to, this is the second image. Um, it's also an image of Esther uh, facing another woman who might be a mirror image. Uh, and in the background to the right, you'll see there's an oval in front of the window. That's a mirror. So mirrors appear often in the illustrations. The illustrations are themselves often mirror images. So a question is, in what way is Caddy Jellyby, Miss Jellyby, a mirror image of Esther? And one answer to that question, which I'll, I'll provide, but I wanna get back to your questions, is that um, Caddy Jellyby is stained with ink. She's a writer. She poses the correspondence. She's the stenographer, the amanuensis for her mother's telescopic philanthropy. Esther, too, is a writer. Esther, too, must have stains of ink on her. Um, so I'm going to stop the share screen and come back to your questions. Courtney, would you please stop the, the share screen? Kevin, Is it stopped? Nope. Oh, John, I think you were trying to share it from your end. I think Kevin was the next person who had a question. Uh, uh, Brad was. Brad, okay, Brad. Hello all, so pleasant to be here. I am, um, I've never read this book before. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe one of the, you know, I'm, I'm maybe one of the few in your group that has not really done a lot of Dickens in my life, but, but this is my first reading and I am struck by the incredible depravity of the world that Dickens is describing. Yes. It feels as if much like our own at the moment, every, every institution or every, every place of morality or power seems to be in some sense of failure. And um, what I find so remarkable about it is that he has still gathered all these threads together and created a story I want to hear. 
and and I'm I'm just profoundly moved by the mastery of taking such unbearable sadness and still recognizing that I want to hear what happens next. <laughs> just I'm just I'm just trying to figure out how that happens, but <laughs> I guess that's the mastery of the author and that's why I'm here and I I just wanted to throw that out. Um I think you're you're entirely correct. I congratulations you you ha you have a wonderful treat ahead of you to to read this novel for the first time and uh, um uh, I we are trying not to spoil <laughs> your uh, your pleasure by giving too many things away, but I, you you point to to something which is clear from the very beginning that this is a fallen world. This is a depraved mm -hmm. world in which things that present themselves as as having power or authority or morality are. Um, if, if not the contrary, at least they are very weak. I mean, what are the centers of goodness that we have encountered? Esther herself seems potentially, but she's very weak in this world. She's an orphan. She has no family. She has no place in the world. Um, and perhaps and, that's why she seems weak um, um, because she, she doesn't have any power. She, ha she has no power. John Jarndyce, um, the, the the man who presents himself as her guardian seems to be uh, perhaps we we have to wait and and find out um, a, a center of morality of true generosity of something that is uh, uh, worth 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 living for and living living with and he intervenes to on behalf of the the poor in the downcast, but he also seems to have a, uh, a weakness, which is that he extends his generosity to the parasitical uh, Harold Skimpole, mm -hmm. who, who seems to-, to, to And Jellybee, and Jellybee appears. And, yes. A, a and, misdirected assistance as well, but- Yes. But and, I wonder, can I just say one last thing and- just Sure. Go out? It seems to me that and I don't, and again, I, I, I'm afraid I don't know the arc of his oeuvre, if you will, but I mean, some of it, of course, I, I, I have some of it, but it seems to me that in this, I'm wondering if we're headed toward the, the, the question of, is the only way beyond the failed power structure of the world is through the efforts of the individual, you know, the efforts of the courageous soul um, to act, regardless of, of what the culture is reinforcing in us? Um, a very good question. That's, that's often the way in which Esther is, uh, is understood in this novel. And of course, we, we have to wait to see what will happen with Esther. But she does um, have uh, a capacity to restore order in chaotic households. When she comes into the Jellaby household, she neatens things up. Um, one of the ways in which Mrs. Jellaby is negligent is that uh, one of her children, Pee Pee, has gotten his head stuck in the, in the bars of a railing and uh, they can't get him out. And Esther comes along and she recognizes that the way to get him out, since he got his head in, the rest of him should go through that way. So she pulls him head forward out into the world um, and, and rescues him. Uh, so uh, as Esther also in the, we didn't get to it, but in chapter eight, covering a multitude of sins, um, when uh, in a, a moment that is one of the, awful moments in the early section of the book, a child dies. A child dies in the room while they are there. And, and Esther is the one who notices it. And Esther is the one who takes the dead baby and covers it with her handkerchief and offers her condolences to the woman 
the women in, and, and shares with them uh, th their sadness. So es Esther has that capacity. We see her, and I would even go so far as to say that Esther is, and it's one of the nicknames that she has, she is a, a little mother. Um, Esther has no mother, but uh, Esther is capable of mothering. In, in, a, in a novel which from very early on has bad mothers or mother figures. Um, Esther, perhaps even because she has no mother, uh, takes the place of a mother to other, other children. Um, and this is a pattern that we'll, we'll see. So thank you for that, for that observation. Thank you. Liam, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? I took my hand down because I think it might contain a slight spoiler. I might send a message to John. Sorry. Nina? Hi, yeah. Um, actually, I just wanted to touch on something that you just sort of asked about, which what, uh, what you sort of mentioned, which was um, sort of about Mr. Skimpole, because, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about how um, the um negligent like n neglecting your family you know and it reflects really bad on mrs jellybee and mrs pardigal but i mean skimpole also does and like nobody seems to care so i just um was curious about how um like that's generally received or taken or if he's actually is supposed to be meant to represent something else and i totally missed it Skimpole is a really puzzling figure because uh, he's paired with Jarndyce and Jarndyce seems to be one of the positive figures, a, a center perhaps of virtue, of morality. But why is he indulging this, this, this parasite who, who clearly uh, is negligent to his children, uh, irresponsible in terms of uh, paying debts, um, uh, Esther has to pay his debt for him. Uh, you know, Esther, who has you know so little power and little money in the world, ends up bailing him out. Um, uh, so he's, he, you know, th for me the real question is why does Jarndyce indulge this this character? How does it reflect on on Jarndyce? And Skimpole you know, we should keep our eye on him as, as with all the minor characters. How will he develop? Where will we see him? Is he one of these characters who remains the same or does he have any other role to play in the, in the novel? He, he's also a figure for a certain kind of artistic ability. He's a poet and a musician. Um, he represents the arts and um, but he's a dilettante. But he's not like high enough class to to do that, right? Well, high enough class to do what? I mean, be like um like a, a male dilettante kind of person or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It just seems sort of his his um his uh pursuits seem to be at odds with his like actual position. But I guess he's just being upheld by Jarndyce, and this is sort of. Yeah. I don't know if this is supposed to be um, like another kind of, you know, subliminal mockery kind of character like Jellybee or whatever, um, or if he actually is supposed to be a foil for somebody else. Um, like, I don't know, uh, people, somebody who cares a lot, um, I don't know, <laughs> about the situations at hand. Well, one thing, one thing to, Try and track is how Esther reacts to Skimpole, um, and so does Esther. Esther, because Esther is lacking in confidence, she's often hesitant to pass judgment on other people. Because in order to judge other people, you have to have a strong enough sense of self in order to make a judgment. And Esther, because of her position in the world, the fact that she's a woman, that she's an orphan, that she has no status, no family, she's entirely dependent, is, is often reluctant 
she, when judgments are made, she often attributes them to Richard, for example. She'll say, Richard, Richard thought such and such, and that, you know, that Mrs. Pardiggle was not a good mother. I, I'm not sure if Richard actually says that, but that's just a, a typical example. And, but uh, does, how does Esther react to Skimpole? And so keep your, keep your eye on okay. um, Sure, sure, um, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, that was just like one thing that was kind of like a little confusing to me. Yeah. Um, but well, what also, then is, someone else. Sorry. What class is, is Skimpole? Skimpole? Skimpole is a member of the middle class. Okay. Um, yeah. And so the other thing was like a, a lot of other people touched on this about Esther and kind of her uh, timidity and, you know, how she, she she's really unsure. And, you know, I, I was really so I read this book by myself you know um and and then uh in talking to people who are a little bit older than me um I found a lot of the reactions to people uh, to Esther was yeah that she's really weak and all this kind of stuff and actually um what was really interesting to me was that I actually thought that for me Esther was really relatable um and that's actually one of the reasons I really like this book because it gives a voice to people who are not very confident who wouldn't usually have a story told about themselves and um actually I think it kind of makes this book even relatable to like today's world where there's so much kind of like pressure telling you that you know you may not be like the best and you may not be worth hearing and that sort of thing so um so it was just really interesting to hear other people's um I guess, perspectives of the narrator, because uh, for me, that was actually one of like the, the best parts of this book. Really, like, it's kind of like a, like a happy ending tale for you know, someone who is shy and someone who is meek. I just wanted to say that also. Okay, well, th thank, you. thank you for that. <laughs> um, while, while we are, there, there's so much to, to, to cover, but I wanted to ask about Esther's doll, because uh, Esther's primary relationship at the beginning, even the, that first paragraph is is with her doll. Used, uh, when I was a very little girl, I used to, indeed, I used to say to my doll when we were alone together, now Dolly, I am not clever, you know very well, you must be patient with me like a deer. And so she used to see, the doll used to sit propped up in a great armchair with her beautiful complexion and rosy lips staring at me, or not so much at me, I think, as at nothing while I busily stitched away and told her every one of my secrets. So um, the doll appears several times in these early chapters. And Esther later on says that when she dreamed, that she used to dream back to the time of her godmother and her doll. And when she leaves Windsor, the place where she lived with her godmother, who turns out to have been her aunt. Um, she does the quite remarkable thing of burying her doll in the garden. So what do you think about Esther's relationship with her doll? So Kathy, hi Kathy, it's been a while. <laughs> And if you if you if your comment is not on about the doll, that's fine. I, I, no, it is. I mean, that's okay. I can yeah. You know, okay. About the last one, but I can okay. say. I just wanted to say about the last thing that I don't think you know Dickens embraced the Me Too movement yet, but you know he was you know a, a you know he had spent his life sort of supporting women's causes. And not, not women, you know, distraught women, women taking care, you know, advantage of. So <clears throat> I think that he sort of had a, a more of a sensitivity toward women who were in peril as opposed to crazy men <clears throat> like Mrs. Mr. Skimple. Uh, about the doll, uh, the doll is just a metaphor for she's totally alone. Nobody speaks to her. I mean, the, the aunt sits her on her birthday, sits on her, on her, she tries to sit on her lap and she's a, the, no presence, never, you know, nothing. And he, you know, says that she's, she's damned from hell because she came from, you know, this despicable place. So, um, you know, who does she have to talk to? I mean, nobody. And so she has a doll, which is very, 
you know, implement, I mean, Barbara Streisand, you know, to, to, to sort of the past future, uh, you know, she would, she did, she would always talk about she didn't have any toys. Um, she's a, she's a, a child who is totally alone. And the doll, and then leaving the doll is like, oh God, I'm not alone anymore. Anyway. Okay. Any other comments about the doll? This is a good start. Wayne, do you have a question? She might have, oh, I'm sorry, Courtney. I wonder if in, in her fantasy life, she might have thought the doll was actually given to her by her mother and it gave her some sort of connection to the mother. And also, I think Esther is an incredibly strong character, given the fact of how she was brought up in her early times. She, she resolves, I'm going to be the best person ever so that I can have a positive. I mean, she could have gotten angry, withdrawn, and instead she really morphed herself into a, I think, quite an upstanding person who, as John says, people rely on. Okay. The, um, but I don't know why she buried the doll that this time. Why, why does she bury the doll? Um, where, where does the doll come from? Good question. Did her mother give her the doll? Um, you know, she has no memory of, of a mother. No. It's a nice fantasy. We, 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 we can speculate, but we, we can't answer that question. But Esther's relationship with the doll is very important. The doll is her only, only friend. So we have a lot of hands right now. Um, <laughs> Robert? Um. It could also be that Esther is closing the door on her on her uh, on her old life at this point in time. She doesn't want to bring uh, the doll with her uh, she, to where she's going. Um, so she wants uh, the doll could mem uh, bring back memories uh, that she would rather uh, not think of, and she's looking forward to her new life. Uh, I'm just speculating at that point. As far as Skimpole, though, I think uh, John Jarndyce surrounds himself with people who are not cookie cutters. Uh, he sees enough of them in, in life, very predictable answers, uh, philosophies, and so forth. Kind of like Abraham Lincoln surrounded, uh, filled his cabinets with his worst detractors because he wanted, he didn't want a bunch of yes men. He wanted people who had different opinions and he felt like uh, if he could survive their criticism that he was even stronger in his own convictions. So um, I think to, to him, Skimple uh, represents a, a very unique uh, uh, look on life, a different aspect, so to speak. And uh, uh, he uses him kind of like a, a sounding board. Uh, Boythorn is, the, is that way too. Boythorn's uh, a unique character, not like anybody else. Um, I read Bleak House uh, 21 years ago, mm -hmm. um, and it was probably my third, my third Dickens novel. And while I was reading it, I was struck by the the fact that this this novel is going to make a great musical. <laughs> Why has nobody ever done it? <clears throat> so. I ended up writing oh, a musical, kidding. a full-length musical based on Blake House. You're kidding, you're kidding. Oh, wonderful. I am not kidding, no. Uh, so last year, uh, it was actually sort of produced because of COVID. It ended up being a kind of a online presentation. Uh, so what I would like to do at the end of our, our, our four months is uh, I'll post it so people will be able to watch it on YouTube. They'll also have access to the script because um, I'm looking forward to uh, some feedback from all of all the people in this group uh, as to uh, what they think of my musical. It's two and a half hours long. My first uh, 
my first read through was three and a half hours long. Uh, so uh, it took a lot of editing when, when you have 67 characters and so forth. So I think that's probably the main reason why it's never been done as a musical is just enormous. <laughs> but uh, Oliver Twist uh, made a very successful musical. And I think John mentioned it's probably his weakest or maybe his worst novel. I don't remember <laughs> what you said. Uh, and he did alter the characters quite a bit. Um, uh, Fagin was nothing like the like, Fagin in the book or whatever. So um, I've managed, at least in my own mind, uh, the the uh, I've kept I've kept the uh, the uh, the book true to its character. I've made it accessible. I think a musical will have um, hopefully uh, bring people into Charles Dickens and uh, Bleak House because I think it's his his uh, best work by far. Um, this is probably the 20th time I've read it. And every time I go to it, it's the well that never runs dry. So um, I, I'm looking forward to, to people that have, have just started it and, and watching their, their journey. In his lifetime, it was considered his best work. And so I just, uh, I find it hard to understand it's probably his, uh, one of his least known. And it's probably due to its unwieldy size, but um, I was always attracted to the to the two narrators. Um, I just thought it was unique, and 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 uh, he did it so seamlessly. I mean, it seems impossible, but to me, I had no problem switching from narrator to narrator. I just I, I just felt the way he did it was very skillful, and and uh, um, and it just only enhanced the novel. Well, congratulations on doing a musical adaptation. I, for one, cannot wait to see the, uh, the musical. Uh, and um, uh, I, there, there are many problems uh, in adaptation and I will yes. be interested to see how you have solved them. Uh, and uh, so, so anyway, thank you for offering to make this available to Everyone oh yes, yeah. I don't. I don't want to spoil anything, but I also had help um, through. Uh, I I visited in Galveston. They have a, a yearly uh, Dickens festival. Yes, and uh, I was able to meet Lucinda Hoxley. Yes, who's the oh, uh, yeah. great great grandniece of, of Charles Dickens, and yes. uh, I persuaded her to to read my uh, my musical and uh, uh, give me some very very uh, very positive. Uh, feedback and encouragement and so forth. So uh, she's done a uh, read through twice already. Uh, so her help has been invaluable um, because uh, she certainly has has a lot of background and, and a lot of input and, and she's British. Uh, you know, I've kind of Americanized it uh, <laughs> to a certain extent because I want it palatable to an American audience. But uh, I think in the long run, uh, both sides of the ocean will be um, very happy with it. We, we will be in your debt and we, we look forward to, to seeing it. And I look forward to reading the script as, as, as well. So, all right. So, uh, you know, I, I trust you'll send that to me. Um, oh, absolutely. At the appropriate time, at the appropriate time. So, so anyway, thanks. Um, let, let me uh, try and direct attention back to the doll, which was uh, the, the place where we started uh, with, with this line of questioning. And, uh, you know, the time goes by so quickly and we've, we've covered so few things, but I wanna dwell down a little bit on, on the doll. And um, so I'm going to read again that first paragraph or the part, one part of it that, that I think is, uh, is important. I'm gonna read a little bit in the second paragraph as, as well of uh, chapter, chapter three. So um, she, the doll, used to sit propped up in a great armchair with her beautiful complexion and rosy lips staring at me or not so much at me as at nothing while I busily stitched away and told her every one of my secrets. So one question is, what does it mean to say that the doll looked at me, not so much at me, I think, as at nothing, while I busily stitched away and told her every one of my secrets. Uh, Irene? Uh, you'll have to unmute.
Um, <laughs> how, how about Peggy? Okay. Hi. A couple of things. Um, it seems to me that the when she asks her aunt about herself, she is so shamed that for her to be able to assert herself or anything would be very impossible. Nobody took care of Esther in any way that is emotional. And when she asked about her mother and asked about herself, she was totally shamed. And it was just sort of injected into her that there was something really, really wrong with her. And that tends to inhibit people completely. That's one thing. I have another thing to say that's not about the doll. Do you want that or not? We have a lot of people here. Let's let's stick with the doll. So I'm, okay, I'm, then so I will um, try, try and get back to you. Yep. So I just yeah. I, anybody I, else want to? People who've had their hand up before me, like David and Wayne. So Wayne. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. There are lots of theories about doll play. My research into doll play has been stymied in part because so much of the research concentrates on how dolls are used to elicit stories of child abuse. But one of the more interesting theories is that the, the child projects feelings on the doll. And the doll is a, a kind of a practice item for the child to uh, learn human empathy. And an uh, outgrowth of that theory is the the taboo about boys with dolls means that boys may not have this practice uh, empathizing with someone or something else. It's remarkable that Esther acknowledges the doll looked at nothing, but she can still project feelings and responses upon the doll. But uh, it's a, it's, it is a fascinating passage. Thanks. Thank you, Wayne. Any other comments? Alice? I think it's, thank you, Wayne, for that idea of empathy. That was, that was <laughs> great. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by how the doll uh, reflects this mirroring of Esther. So before we have um, Esther speaking to the doll, she says in, you know, right at the end of the very first sentence of chapter three, for I know I am not clever. And then she repeats that same idea when she speaks to her doll, when she's alone with her doll. Now, Dolly, I am not clever. So that idea of that mirroring that happens uh, seems to allow Esther the opportunity to reflect her inner world to her outer world. I think to a certain extent, the doll is, is helping her reflect her inner world to her outer world. And just for one more case in point, right at the end when she's leaving Windsor, she says to, Oh, the driver, um, she's crying at the end. And she says, and, and, the, and it said to her, what the devil are you crying for? And she said, I was so frightened that I lost my voice and could only answer in a whisper. So thinking about these two passages and knowing that she's buried her doll really helps me to put together that perhaps that mirroring that the doll provides her with is now actualized in a world where she can express herself, but only for now in a whisper. Mm -hmm. um, very good observations. And um, uh, I, I, I like in particular the, the second passage that you, that you pointed us to, because I think Esther's voice is as important as her face. I mean, Esther's, Esther's face and how her face is mirrored in the various, particularly young women, but not just young women, uh, almost all of the female figures in the novel, Miss Flight, for example, or Caddy Jellyby, or, or uh, Ada, all of, all of these figures are in some way reflections of, of Esther, who has no face. I mean, we, 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 we can exaggerate and say she has no face because in the illustration, she does not have one. 
But Esther is trying to create a faith. She's trying to create a sense of self, a personality, because she has been raised in such a way as, as to think that she is not a person of any substance or of any worth. And in this uh, little play action that she describes in the first, in the first paragraph, um, the theory that I would invoke in order to describe what's going on is from the, um, the, the psychoanalyst uh, D.W. Winnicott talks about what is called a transitional object. And he writes about uh, the role of the teddy bear or the role of, of the, the imaginary friend object. Um, and in Winnicott's theory, the transitional object, what he calls the transitional object, which is what the doll is in this, in this um, passage, functions as a substitute for the mother. And the child uses the doll in order to negotiate that basic problem of separation from the mother. That the, in the play activity with the doll, on the one hand, the child is the mother and the doll is the baby. In another moment, the doll is the mother and the child is the baby. And what's being negotiated is the problem of separation from the mother because the child cannot become a self until it has separated from the mother. Esther's problem in life, her major problem is that she has no mother. So she uses the doll as a mother substitute. She comes home from school and she tells the doll every one of her secrets. Ha ha ha, you know, what are, what are Esther's secrets? What are the secrets that a little girl has coming home from, from school? You know, um, we, we can fill in the blank. But at another level, what is Esther's secret? This is a novel about secrets. There are secrets in this novel. And Esther does have a huge secret. And the secret is where does she come from? And Esther doesn't know the answer to that. So in playing this with the doll, in telling her her secrets, in telling the doll her secrets, she's trying to get at the larger secret question that she cannot answer. Um, so uh, the doll looks at her and the doll stares at her or not so much at me as at nothing. Why does the doll stare at nothing? Well, dolls are inanimate. Dolls don't have eyes that focus. So when they look, they don't see, they stare at nothing because dolls are dolls. But at another level, Esther is saying something very important because if the doll is a version in her play activity, of the mother. The mother is staring at the infant or staring at nothing. Esther feels that she is nothing. She is no one. She is a nobody. And that is one of her major problems. That's, in, that's tied to her secret, is that because she has no mother, she has no existence. And the doll is the, the mirror that would confer on her an identity or a selfhood. But when the doll looks at her, it sees nothing. And Esther, in some very deep and profound and tragic way, feels that she is nothing. And it's because of the absence of mothering. So when Esther is surrounded by all of these bad mothers, it's a novel about bad mothers, Pardiggle and, and, and Jellybee and the godmother. Um, uh, at, and then Esther goes around mothering children in trouble because she's trying to fill the, the gap that she experienced in her own life, that there was no mother there. So what is the relationship to the mother and how does Esther constitute a self if she has no mother to validate her? And the only mother that she has from early in her life is this horrible godmother aunt who tells her that she should never have been born and refuses to celebrate her birthday. And Esther's birthday becomes a focus of her secret. 
you could say that's what Esther's secret is, is her birth date. What is, what happened when she was born? Why does she not have a mother? Um, these I think are the very profound existential issues that Esther is grappling with and her coy self-effacing manner is a kind of defense, a way of coping with that. But what they indicate is a profound lack of self-esteem, a profound lack of self-worth. And can she, will she be able, and how will she be able to, uh, to overcome that deficit is I think the major psychological issue that the novel has to deal with. And the, you know, we, we will see. I wanna read one other passage from that chapter three that uh, I think deals with this very issue. Um, one of the things that Esther has a great deal of difficulty with is separations, saying goodbye. Because every time that she says goodbye to a place or to people or any, to anyone she cares about, um, it has the potential to reactivate a separation that she can't explain, that she can't understand, which is the separation from the mother. So here is, um, this is the paragraph that describes the burying of the doll. And I wanna, that's where I wanna conclude. Um, the coach was at the little lawn gate. We had come out, we had not come out until we heard the wheels. And thus I left her with a sorrowful heart. She went in before my boxes were lifted to the coach roof and shut the door. As long as I could see the house, I looked back at it from the window through my tears. My godmother had left Mrs. Rachel all the little property she possessed, and there was to be a sale and an old hearth rug with roses on it, which always seemed to me the first thing in the world I had ever seen was hanging outside in the frost and snow. A day or two before, I had wrapped the dear old doll in her own shawl and quietly laid her, I am half ashamed to tell it, in the garden earth under the tree that shaded my old window. I had no companion left but my bird and I carried him with me in his cage. Esther is burying, she's, she's repeating a loss, an experience of loss. Burying the doll is burying herself. And she carries with her, instead of the doll, a bird, which is repla a replacement for the, uh, for the doll. And the bird is in the cage. So Esther is going forth into the world, having said goodbye, with the memory of this, a very strange little detail, an old hearth rug with roses on it, which always seemed to me the first thing in the world I had ever seen. What, what is that hearth rug? Um, anyway, the replacement of a caged bird for the doll, I think, is a, a, a significant moment in Esther's development. Um, we have to stop. We've barely scratched the surface of, of this wonderful novel, um, a musical version of which awaits us at the end of the four <laughs> weeks, four months that we will spend on it. So. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I, I apologize for not having covered everything I would have loved to have talked with you about or answered all the questions and comments that people had. Um, but I will see you um, a month from now in October. So thanks and bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Mm -hmm.